It gives me great pleasure today to be able to introduce two men of the great. I have long lists here of the accomplishment of these two gentlemen. One, one of our matric boys, Kavik Dula, currently is busy writing maths this very day. In fact, he's about to get his geometry paper. Good luck to Kavir for that. Uh, but Kavir will be interviewing Mr. Stanley Bergman, one of our illustrious old boys who lives in New York. They might be separated by oceans, they might be separated by generations. However, they all share the common heritage of this beloved school of arts. Now, in, in terms of introducing them, this could take some while. I think it's far more important that we see the two of them being able to get to know each other a little bit, finding out about each other, finding out about the essence of who they are and their wonderful accomplishments. Kabir, over to you. Welcome to Mr. Bergman, who is the CEO of Henny Shine. Welcome, Mr. Bergman. Thank you for giving up your time to, to come to this interview. No, thank you. I'm very, very excited, Kabir, to be speaking with you. Uh, the background uh, behind you uh, brings back fond memories and the jacket and tie you're wearing brings back great, great memories of the world uh, 50 plus years ago. It's a long time. Definitely, sir, definitely. Congratulations on your results at Gray. It's quite, uh, quite remarkable. Good job. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed my time at this school. You'll remember it for all your life. Yes. We would love to, to hear more about what's not in your bio. Can you please share a bit about your upbringing in South Africa and life experiences that have shaped your thinking as a business leader? Sure, Kabir. Uh, well, I grew up in Port Elizabeth. Um, my parents fled from Germany, Nazi Germany, and arrived on the shores of Port Elizabeth in 1936. And one of the first places they uh, were welcome was in South End, Port Elizabeth. Of course, South End was a remarkable community. These were people that had been in South Africa for decades, came from all over what was then the British Empire, from India, from Pakistan, what is now Pakistan, the whole Indian continent from uh, the areas of East Asia and from the UK, from people that were uh, uh, descendants were from the Netherlands, from France, from all over, and uh, many people also from China. And this community was a remarkable community, M multiple religions. The v diversity was just fantastic. And I, my parents were welcomed in that community. My father had a store, Eric Stores, and by the way, there's a book, it's called South End As We Know It. And for anyone watching this video, I would say, go to the South End Museum and take a look. It reflects a phenomenal period in South African history. This book was published, it's called The uh, South End As We Knew It. And in it is a picture of my dad's store, Eric Stores on South Union Street. That was the environment I grew up in. Loving people, people that took care of me and taught me so much about life from my earliest memories, two or three years old. Sadly, that community was destroyed by the apartheid government in the 60s when the community was broken up and that vibrant, wonderful life that I knew growing up ended. That's where I learned a lot about the strength of diversity, pluralism, the importance of how people can impact your life, how people can educate you on how life works, how to move things along, get things done, and now simply to enjoy people from different walks of life. That was the environment that I grew up and set the framework for me then to go to the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where I yet met other people from a diverse, different diverse background. And uh, that set the stage for me to in fact, 
moved my career along, ultimately moving to the United States, entering to the business world. And if it's time, we can talk more about that. That's, that's amazing, sir. Yeah. I was also lucky to have been to South End Museum and I've been through there and it's, it's really amazing. There's some amazing stories in there. Yeah, well, Kabir, you know, uh, this community in South End was vibrant yeah. and people helped each other. There was a fish market, I remember it, where people, the fishermen would bring their fish and everybody would meet them. People would go into buy their fresh fruits from one store and another, their clothing. There were great schools. Many people that went to school in South End went on to have great careers and it was just ended. And there's so much that's written in the history books about the apartheid period but this is one of those real people tragedies that you can't describe in a history book. People were uprooted and moved away and friends could no longer relate to each other on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, it's extremely sad, but um, we're lucky that we're moving in the right direction now. Yeah. yeah. And you and your family have been extremely involved in philanthropic organizations and not to mention your day-to-day -day job as well. Where do you find the time to fit this all in? Well, firstly, when it comes to time, Kabir, you know who, who are the best people to get things done? Busy people. Yes. Because busy people, look in your own life. Look what you're doing. Look at your role at Gray. You're in the classroom. You're outside the classroom. You're in the leadership role. You know, people that take on a lot by definition, get things done. So I've always believed, going back to my family roots, that it is important to focus on three things in life. Family, friends, number one, biggest priority. Then you have to balance that with your profession. And then you have to balance it with something else that's interesting. Many people are gray, uh, are into sports. Many are into various philanthropic causes that make a positive impact on society. And many are interested in other things. I, for example, of course, view family as number one, advanced my career. I was interested in philanthropy, various groups that made a difference in the community, in the world. But I also balance that a lot with my interest in music. Uh, and of course, I've found ways to learn about the world by traveling. If you combine all of these things, it's amazing how fruitful your life can be. But at the end of the day, important to give back because if you give back, you will receive more than you give in terms of relationships and in terms of interest in life. So I've been able to expand that to my business dealings with my colleagues, because we as a company believe that you can do well by doing good, combining what business does to drive the cause of the business, and at the same time, find ways to give back to society through the business. And that works very well. These are called what's, these are referred to as higher ambitions businesses, businesses that have a higher ambition than making money. And of course, today, the whole notion of business, working with government, with other sectors in society, known as public-private partnerships, are the businesses that are succeeding. The vaccines were created by collaboration between government and business. And talking about the company now, COVID has obviously had a devastating impact, not only on the economy, but people's livelihoods as well. So what have been some major challenges that you've had to deal with while leading a, a company like Unishine? Good question, uh, Career. Well, 
Henry Schein is the largest provider of products and some services to dentists and to medical doctors in their private practice. So you can imagine during COVID, uh, one of the biggest priorities was to ensure that our customers had enough what's called PPE, products that are uh, 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 protective products, masks and gloves and cleaning solutions. So this was a big focus. But at the same time, our warehouses and our factories were working, but we could not bring people into the office. So everyone had to work from home by video, initially by telephone. And that was a big challenge. So we had to combine providing PPE to our customers, including governments around the world, while working from home. Tests were also an area that was important for us. What is called rapid point of care tests, tests that are provided right on the spot, uh, that where the results are provided right on the spot. This was very important for us. But a key part of our success, getting things done, as we spoke early on, getting things done was important during this COVID period, relates to the fact that we worked very closely with many stakeholders, business, people that make products, that distribute the products, logistics companies, academic institutions, medical schools. Congratulations, I understand you want to go to medical school and have applied. That's a great step forward. I'm confident you'll get into a good medical school. But we worked, had to work with all those public health people that were involved in determining the direction for society during COVID. And then we had to work with government, uh, local governments, cities, but also national governments, and played a big role in working also with organizations like the World Health Organization. So these were all the challenges that we focused on during COVID. But also at the beginning of COVID, we were not sure what the financial impact would be of COVID. So we had to preserve our cash very carefully because we didn't know how long this would last and whether in fact business would be significantly impacted financially and for how long. So all of this had to be balanced. And the key in for us was our 21,000 team members around the world worked in a collaborative way to deal with these challenges. Yeah, I can't imagine the amount of stress that you were under and also the adjustment that, that you had to undergo when working from home because being isolated and not being able to work with people in terms of the physical room, it's a bit hard and challenging. And uh, I experienced that during lockdown last year when we went through online learning it was a big adjustment and I struggled myself quite a bit. Yes, uh, the, the isolation is what's the worst because yeah. we people like to interface with others. And, you know, in one way or another, there are mental stresses for everyone. I don't care who you are, you're under mental stress during this time because we people are human animals. We like to be with other people. Yes, yes. And especially like myself, being very social, it, it was extremely hard because now everything's gone online and talking face-to-face -face is completely different to chatting through WhatsApp or anything else. Yes. Somebody told me recently, or I heard it, I was on one of these Zoom calls with a group of other business people, and somebody said, you can get things done by Zoom or video calls, but you cannot build trust video calls. Yes. You have to be with people. Yes, no, that's, that is extremely so, true. How long were you on lockdown? Um, a couple of level five lockdown, which was complete lockdown, lasted for two or, two or three months. It was quite long. Wow. And yeah, lots of businesses were affected and the relief fund from the government could only go so far, you know. 
So lots of businesses were shut down and it was quite devastating to this fragile economy that we have in South Africa. Yeah, I'm sure because also the hospitals were kept busy with COVID yes. and people that had normal illness just couldn't get healthcare, right? Exactly, yes. And it was a big risk if someone had to just go to the hospital because they could have stood a chance of contracting COVID yeah. themselves. Yeah. And the world is obviously moving in a new direction now. We're entering a new era, which is the fourth industrial revolution. What advice do you have for boys and how can they prepare for this fourth industrial revolution that we are entering? Yes, it's a very important question. The fourth industrial revolution deals with the fact that we have moved in a significant way towards a digital world. Everything is digitalized. Just jump in a car and see all the things that are digitalized. Look in your home. Everything's from a coffee machine to uh, going into a store. Everything's digitalized. Well, that was before COVID. Now, what COVID did is advance this digitalization in a significant way. Speed, things that, as I said, the things that may have taken five to 10 years to advance from a digital point of view, advanced in six months. So during COVID, the digitalization advanced very quickly. Unfortunately, there's an impact on society. Firstly, there's the mental impact because, you know, it's great talking to you by video. That's tremendous advance. On the during this fourth industrial revolution. Remember, I grew up at the beginning of fax machines. So think of how far the world has come. When I was a grade, there was no such a thing as a fax machine. So just think of how fast the world has moved, and in particular in this period now. So the challenge is it has an implication on one, the mind, but the big challenge is some people can keep up with the technology. Very few of us actually, I can't, too many changes, but some are completely left out of this digital revolution, if you wanna call it. And what we have is the digital divide. And that's a big challenge because those that do not have the ability to follow and go along with the fourth industrial revolution as accentuated during COVID, will have a hard time making a living. And so that leads to social unrest around the world, a big challenge. But you asked a question of what your classmates, class below you should focus on. And that is you need to become digitally savvy. You do not need to be a programmer I'm not even sure if those kind of professions will exist in the future because there'll be certain enormous automation. You don't need to be an expert in artificial intelligence or quantum or computing, but you have to be able to operate in this digital environment and stay current. Not necessarily, as I said, from a technical point of view, but just being able to function in this environment. But I would hasten to say to you, that that is important, keeping current on the digital side. But the fundamental success of anybody in society, whether it's with your family, whether it's in medical school, in business, being the rector or a teacher, is the ability to work well with others. And the only way to get things done is through other people, and so what is important is to ensure that you have time for other people and that you build your skills in working with other people. And when you're in a setting with colleagues is to figure out how you can get consensus amongst that group in a relatively quick time period. And so the leaders of tomorrow, the people that will be successful in society will have the ability to work with others, get people to agree pretty quickly, 
people disagree and figure out a way to keep the people that disagree engaged. So it's all about people, but which should not be lost in the fourth industrial revolution, but, and that's the foundation, but the fourth industrial revolution requires one to understand the tools of technology, not necessarily as an engineer, but the basic tools for operating in this new world, which will only become more industrial from a technology point of view as the years go by. Yes, no, certainly. And with artificial intelligence taking over now, um, it has its good and bad. Good in terms of that we can get things done more efficiently and at a faster rate, but bad because people who do manual jobs obviously going to struggle to get jobs now. And the digital, digital divide that you mentioned is just going to keep on getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, so all the groups, schools like Gray, have a very important role because a lot of people do not have access to technology at home. So Gray needs to allow people into the school that may have to catch up a little bit, but yes. that have the intellect to and the people skills to do well in a post-education environment or even while they're at school. So our job is to ensure that everyone has the tools. It's an idealistic view. But that's what we should strive towards. Yes, no, certainly. And I think Ray has taken huge steps forward to help boys get tech savvy as well. I know they've introduced ICDL, which is getting boys up to speed on things like um, Word, Microsoft, and Excel, which is going to be vital eventually for them. Yes, very, very important. And yeah. hopefully one day when you graduate, you'll come back to the school and help. Uh, perhaps take on a couple of mentors in this area. Yes, no, I hope so. And I just want to quickly take you back to the past now. What was Gray like during your time and what do you think has changed over the years? Because if we compare, compare my time to your time, it's completely different. So I'm just a bit intrigued to wonder how, how was it during your time? Yes, it's a very good question. And I'd like to answer it slightly differently from the way you may expect me to answer it. First of all, I was a terrible student. Um, when I went to Gray, what was important was to learn how to recite, to memorize things, plays and Churchill's speeches and stuff. I had a very bad, very challenging time remembering. I had a terrible handwriting. Um, but I was a dreamer. I was not really into sport. And the traditional teachers did not really, were not really equipped to deal with me. But there were a few teachers at Gray that helped me. In fact, the challenge was the teacher in my matric year told me not to go to university. But there were people that helped me. There was a particular geography teacher that spent a lot of time with me improving on my handwriting. There was a teacher that encouraged me to start a stamp collecting club at the school, which I did, and play chess. And uh, there was a teacher that was involved in what was called bookkeeping in those days that said, okay, you learn bookkeeping, but I'm gonna teach you a little bit about businesses, which is what you're interested in. So my experience was not the traditional academic route, nor the traditional playing field, but there were enough teachers there that gave me grounding in the basic tools for life and recognized that I may not be the person that could memorize everything, but I had a vivid imagination and they encouraged me. I believe that today that's probably much more common, but in the 1950s and 60s, that was not common in education. I've got a solid education, ability to write and read, uh, but I didn't play along with the basic 
sports stuff. Having said that, I was very well equipped when I went to university because the tools I got, writing, reading, thinking, helped me in a significant way. And once I got to university, I found things I liked to do, which were not so common within the educational system in a high school, for example. But uh, I learned tremendous values at grade, the uh, importance of integrity, the importance of respecting people. Uh, these are the things that really laid the groundwork for me in my career and my life. I also learned at grade the importance of family, the importance, as I said, of friendship. So um, I got a nurturing environment that, by the way, stood me well at university, but I had a challenge in university. It was before computers. So the professors couldn't read my handwriting, but I found a couple of professors, one in particular, the person that ran the law department at Wits, who would let me read my essays to him, my exams. And instead of getting a basic pass, I got the highest grades because he was spent the time with me, which led me in life to understand that people that care about others can have a huge impact on those others. And so when I find people that are challenged, but have the basic values that are important and have raw material to succeed, maybe they don't have the certain aspects of basic educational foundations today writing is not important. I have a son who has a learning disability and we had a challenge in high school until his last year when a teacher picked it up and then did brilliantly at university where they gave me, allowed him to use a computer. I learned over my life that helping others that are disadvantaged pays off. And I have to say, both in terms of the pleasure you get out of it, but also in business, I have a lot of people that may be challenged in one way or another that have become major contributors and of course help the organization I'm with. And I couldn't help but notice you said you have you had a bookkeep bookkeeping club and a stamp collecting club, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Now that's that's quite funny. And uh, and it's it's not funny, but it's quite amazing to see. The clubs and societies we have now, I mean, we have the programming club. I don't know if Gray Union, Gray Union was probably still there when you were at school. I'm not sure. Uh, they were certainly not as philanthropically driven as today. No. Okay. Yes, no. It was a, more, much more of a sports club, I would imagine. Yes, yes. Because uh, <laughs> I myself am quite involved in clubs and societies at the school, so it, it it gives me great pleasure to hear stuff like that that existed back then. Well, the key is to find teachers that are interested. Yes. And, um, you know, Gray, when I was there, was a lot more rigid. You know, yes. this is the curriculum you have to do, and you have to play sports and you have to march. Yes. Um, but there are people that don't fit into that mold. I didn't fit into it. And there are a lot of people that have made, made major contributions in the world that did not fit into basic academic tracks. Churchill is one, one of my greatest heroes. Um, Einstein was a terrible student. And you've got to allow in the educational environment for people that have imagination. And as Einstein said, logic will take you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. So what, yes, is it, yes. what, what does it feel like to be ready to graduate from Vitz, to, from uh, Gray? What, you know, you're ready to become what they're called an old boy. Yes, yes. No, it's a surreal feeling. Um, I'm still sort of processing that I've ended my high schooling career. It felt like just the other day, I was a grade eight, going from class to class, running quickly. So I, I was not late for class because we were quite scared of the prefix during my year if we were late class. And it's it's a great honor to be called an old gray now. 
and it, it's a massive privilege. I didn't think this day would come so soon, but uh, that's how that's how life works, I guess. Well, I've got some news for you. The older you get, the quicker it goes. But enjoy every minute. So, what inspired you to apply to medical school? Um, I always had a passion since I was young uh, about helping people, and I found that through the medical field, I am able to do that to the best of my ability. And what even further catalyzed this was when I had to undergo surgery for my torn ACL last year, I was very intrigued and curious about how my body would react to the surgery and how I would heal. So those two things put together really, really made me want to learn more about the medical field and the body itself, yeah. Fantastic. You broke, you, you dislocated or you snapped your ACL during sports? Yes, yes uh, I was playing soccer with my friends. And uh, just unfortunately, I guess by chance, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And it unfortunately just snapped. Well, we have that in common. I was standing on the side of a ski, mount, of a ski mountain. And a friend of my son hit me. Uh, on the side of my leg, it wasn't a terrible hit, but you know, if you hit just in the right spot, the yes. ACL. So I lost my ACL <clears throat> and my meniscus. My meniscus was connected, but uh, my ACL, I don't have one. So I ski with the left side without an ACL. And then 10 years later, a colleague of mine, we went skiing and his younger son hit me on the right side. So I have a problem with my right knee, but I'm not giving up skiing. Yes, yes, no, it's, and in terms of the recovery, it's been very hard so far because having a new ligament being put in, it's, it's been quite a journey so far. The leg isn't 100% yet, but I'm slowly getting there. I, I'm well, not sure if it was the same for you. Um, well, how long ago did you have it? Um, I took <coughs> last year, January. Yeah, I think it's going to take a while to get, maybe another year or so. But yeah. um, I know a lot of people, I, I ski a lot, a lot of ski instructors lose their ACL and they get repaired. Yeah. You're very fortunate. The procedure now is, is quite uh, standard and it works. Yes. You know, I tore my ACL uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Well, 35 years ago, life goes fast. Uh, there were... The procedures and the technology wasn't great, but now it's pretty good. But you have to do your uh, physical therapy. You, have, you know yes. that. Yes, it's it's taken a while, but slowly getting there. Yeah. Right, right, right. And so, so, Kafir, what, what, what did you uh, treasure most during your time at Gray? Well, the brotherhood and the friendships that I formed is something that I'll forever cherish. I mean. That's right. Some of my friends I might not ever see again. So I'm really trying to absorb every moment that I have left with, with my friends and also my family because I might be going off to university soon. I might not see them as well for some time. And, you know, my confidence levels have increased and gone through the roof since I've joined Gray. Um, I only joined Gray in grade eight and then I was a very shy and uh, insecure person, but now the values that have been instilled in me and the and the lessons that I've been taught, I feel like I'm a completely different person that's ready to take on the world. And one thing about Gray is though, it fosters its boys to become leaders and ultimately good citizens that we need in today's societies. Yeah. yeah. What you said is terrific. I would just like to give you one little bit of advice. The good news is there are things called computers now. You will stay in touch with your friends. It takes a little extra effort, but I have maintained friendships around the world. Um, until the internet, it wasn't easy. So, I mean, I'd go to a city and meet somebody. But now I do spend quite a bit of time. I don't do a lot of work, uh, time, don't spend a lot of time on social media. But to my friends, a lot of the friends I grew up in, with in Port Elizabeth, I'm in communication then by uh, email. And now, of course, there's lots of other ways to do it. But I would recommend you stay in touch with people. And don't forget your family. You know, 
when I was your age, family was important, but I didn't quite understand it. Then I had kids, and then I got more serious, but now I'm a grandfather. And I don't care so much about my kids, but I want to be in touch with my five grandchildren regularly, daily. And just remember, it's important for you to stay in touch with those people that care about you. So a quick email, a quick uh, FaceTime call will go a long way. And it's amazing how these friends you made at Gray and outside of Gray will be with you for the rest of your life. Yes, no, that's, that's very true. <clears throat> I'm going to have to cover one little topic with you. Yes. Be politically correct. I'm, of course, enormously supportive of the fact that Gray is an all boys school. Yes. But if I didn't mention that it's important to work closely with women in the workplace, uh, and when you go to university now, uh, the notion of diversity is applicable in many, many different ways. And I think it's important. It's great to have the traditional gray education or the collegiate education, but the notion of diversity in the in university classroom, in business, in social, in all walks of life is critical. Yes, yes. Now, certainly it is now. We're moving in a new area now where things are changing and we need to adapt as well. Right. I, I was lucky enough to, to be at a co-ed school for my junior years. And I only arrived at Gray for high school. So I've had the best of both worlds. And uh, yes, it's it's helped me quite a bit. And I understand what you're saying. It would be beneficial if boys could learn how to work with um, women as well. But the values that I've, <laughs> that I've learned at this school have been extremely important and I'm not sure if I would have learned it somewhere else. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not challenging the system. Yes, yes. But if I didn't say this, yeah. And my granddaughters <laughs> saw this video 15 years from now, they would be a little bit uh, upset with me. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. And I, I remind you know my wife Mary is a medical doctor, and when she went to Vitz uh, 50 years ago, I think there was six or seven percent of her class were women. Now the graduating class of most medical and dental schools around the world is a majority of women. So, uh, but I think that the, the system of, of gray and collegiate is a, is a very solid system. Yes. I wouldn't want to challenge that, but I, I would. I just thought I should add this particular yeah. sentence. I completely sense. understand. Yes. Uh, and if you could leave us with one last piece of advice for gray boys, what would it be? One very important and pivotal piece of advice. I'll leave you with uh, two thoughts. One is, it's all about people. You can be the most technically capable person in the world. Key is to figure out what's on the mind of others, how you can help others, because you know what? If you help others, they help you. Plus, it's enjoyable and you get a lot of satisfaction. And the second is, Dream big. The question of why, the, the statement, why not? That question looms with me every day. Think much bigger than you think you're capable of doing. Because to quote the late President Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. So congratulations on the work you've done at the school on your achievements, and we have great expectations of you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I know how busy you are to just chat to us. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that gray boys will find this very informative going forward in their lives. It's been a huge honor and privilege. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kabir. Good luck. <laughs>